In Acts chapter 27 and verse 20, it says this in the New Living Translation. It says, and the terrible storm raged for many days, and it blotted out the sun and the stars. It's a real bad storm, but there's a phrase there. It says that the storm raged for many days until all hope was gone. All I've ever done is pastor people. It's the only thing I've ever done in life. I'm with people on their best day. I'm with people on their worst day. I'm with people when they feel like they're on the mountaintop, and I'm with people when they feel like the mountain's on top of them. But too often i found that people at times can lose hope. See, if I were to poll you right now in this place, here's what I know. The majority of you are great people of faith. If I were to ask you, do you believe that Jesus saves, you would say yes. If I were to ask you, do you believe that Jesus heals, you would say yes. If I were to ask you, do you believe that God can deliver people, you would say yes. If I were to ask you, do you believe that God can provide for people, you would say absolutely yes. But then, if I were to spend time with some of you and ask this question, do you believe God can heal you? Some of you felt bad for so long that you've lost all hope that you will ever feel good again. If I were to ask you, do you believe that God can restore your marriage? It's not that you don't believe that God can restore things. It's that in your marriage, it's been bad for a long time, and you've lost hope. See, I find that right now in the body of Christ that we have a lot of people who have great hope, but they don't have a lot of hope. And the reason that's so important is that God made you to be a person of hope. You were born to be a person of hope. When God created you, when God made you, he made you to be a hopeful person. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. That whenever there's the absence of hope, something inside us quits working. It doesn't produce the way God wants it to produce. God wants you to be a person of hope. It was a Sunday afternoon, like uh, your pastor does. We do multiple services. I'm tired. But one of the things I do to relax is I read. There was a magazine that had been sent to us just because they were desiring that maybe we would subscribe to it. I had picked it up with no intention other than scanning through it. But as I went through it, there was an article. And it was an article entitled this, I Wished I Could Prescribe Hope. The title really intrigued me because I'd never heard anything like that in print. And then I began to read the article and I found out that it was by a very famous surgeon who did some of the most difficult surgeries on people in our nation. And he said, I wished I could prescribe hope. And what he then went into was he said, there are times when I've done surgery on people. And he said, I do back-to-back surgeries, and the people were similar in their condition, they were similar, similar in their diagnosis, their prognosis, but one would go well and one would go bad. And he said, through the years, I would ask myself, why is it that I have two people that are exactly the same as far as what I need to do? One of them struggles, the other one does not struggle. And he says, after years of doing this, I realized the one thing I can't do as a doctor is I cannot prescribe hope. He says, usually as a surgeon, you always sit down with your patients before they go into surgery. And he says, I've had people literally look me in the eye and say, doctor, I know this is a tough surgery. I know it's a hard surgery. I know it's going to take some time and it's going to take some effort. But I'm telling you right now, I'm coming out of this. I want you to know that I'm going to make it. I'm coming out of this, that everything's going to be all right. I want you to know that. And he says, I will do a surgery backed up to that, and I'll have that pre-meeting, and someone will look at me, pastor, and say to me as a surgeon, hey, I want you to know I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. I have concerns about it. I'm afraid I'm not going to make it through. And he says, I've learned through the years that the person who has hope does better than the person who doesn't. The person who has the expectation that they are going to come out of something, they do better than the person who doesn't. I have a dear friend uh, who has since gone home to be with Jesus. His name was John Osteen. Many of you know his son, Joel. Now, John and I were close friends. Joel and I are friends, but we're not really, really that close. 
But John and I were, and so I got to know him, and I got to know his wife, Dodie. Every year, they would do this amazing conference at Thanksgiving, and they would bring in missionaries from everywhere. And as they would bring in these missionaries, it would just be a week-long event investing in them for what they were doing around the world. At one of these particular Thanksgiving moments, Dodie's sitting on the front row, but she gets up to go to the restroom. When she walks out, she goes, but she doesn't come back. All of a sudden, people begin to notice that Dodie hasn't come back. And so one of the daughters-in-law goes and looks for her. They find her in the restroom, unconscious, hemorrhaging. One of her sons is an MD, is a doctor. They got him. He ran back there. Immediately, they called the ambulances. They called the ambulance. They come in. They do all the things that are necessary there uh, to get her to the hospital. She's unconscious for an extended period of time. They begin to run some tests, and the tests come back that she has a cancer that is so aggressive that very few people ever survive it. Literally, when she wakes up, her son walks in, who's the MD. He knows the prognosis of this. He knows the likelihood of her surviving is very, very slim. As a doctor, he is looking at this and thinking, my goodness, I'm, I'm, I've got to tell my mom she's basically going to die. He couldn't do it, and he walked out of the room. Someone else began to tell. Next few days, they ran some tests, but after a few days, Dodie looked at them and said, I want you to take me home. The son who was a doctor said, Mom, we can't take you home. We need to do some procedures. He says, I'm not against you doing the procedures. I'll come back. We'll do the procedures, but I need to be at home. He said, Mom, just stay here. She said, no, I'm not staying here. He said, why why aren't you going to stay here? He said, everything about this room tells me I'm going to die. I want to be in my house. And she said to all the kids, I want these pictures. It was pictures of her riding her horses because she loved to ride. It was pictures of her and the grandkids. Just understand, if you're a kid, there comes a day when the parents don't want pictures of you in their room. They just want the grandkids. <laughs> and so they began to put all the pictures of the grandkids in there. And they said, why do you want that? She said, I want to see my future. I want to see me riding horses. I want to see me playing with the grandkids. I want to see me out there. Now, the thing about Dodie was she ended up recovering from that, and she wrote this great book called Healed of Cancer. But you know what Dodie knew? She knew that if she was going to get better, she not only had to believe that God could do something, but have hope that it would happen to her. And what I found is that so many people, they just lack the hope aspect. But see, you were created for hope. You were created to believe that tomorrow's going to be better than today. You were created to believe that the future out there is going to be a good thing and not a bad thing. You were created to believe that there is something out there that it will inspire you and be better. And it doesn't matter what today is. Tomorrow's coming, and God's still going to be there. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing right now. There's a tomorrow. And when people have that hope on the inside, side of them, it makes them better. Because God said, hope is a tree of life. It begins to give life to you like the tree of life in the garden did. It begins to give life to you. And here's the thing. Right now, we have people who have great faith in God, but they have little hope in their life. But you've got to understand something. God created you to be a person of hope. That's number one. Number two is this. Hope does for your soul. Hope does for your soul what faith does for your heart. See, you're the creation's highest level in this world. You're created differently than everything else because there's three parts of you. You have a spirit, a soul, and a body. You have a heart. Now, that heart lives to have faith in it. It lives for faith, but in the way the heart needs faith and the body needs food, the soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, it needs hope. 
In Psalm 42 and verse 11, David writes this. He says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? He says, why is it when you get up in the morning, you're just always down? Why are you always in this hole? Why aren't you cast down on this, O my soul? Why is it that you find yourself being on the negative side of life? Why is it you feel like you're always put down? Why is it that you feel like you're never going to make it out of whatever you're in? He says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. See, he knew that his soul would be better if he had hope. If you went to the Library of Congress, you would find that there's a book that always, every year, is in the top 10 of the most read books in the history of man. It's a book by Viktor Frankl, a man who survived the Nazi Holocaust. And it's a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's one of the most intriguing books that anyone can read. And in there, Victor tells a part of his story. He tells about the day that he was captured by the Germans and they took him to the concentration camp. He talks about what it was like to be stuffed into a train where too many people were stuffed into one place and, and some people suffocated just by the number of people around them. And he tells about arriving at the concentration camp. And when we arrived at the concentration camp, the guards would look at them and immediately either point to the left or they'd point to the right. If you went to the left, that meant you were going to the gas chambers right then. You were not going to live another day. They had looked at you and said, you did not have the strength, the wherewithal to help them in anything they needed. If you went to the right, you were probably going to eventually go to the gas chambers. But if you went over there, it meant that you were going to be someone that they were going to use the last remaining strength you had to do something. He talks about that in his life, he had a pride and joy. And his pride and joy was that he had written a manuscript. He was a, a practicing psychologist and he had written a manuscript on the behavior of people. As he had written this, it was his joy. He wanted to get it published. But he knew that in the concentration camp that, that he had to sneak it in. So he had literally uh, sewed it into his garments in hopes that the Germans wouldn't find it. When they got off, they pointed him to the right. Many of his family members went to the left. He would never see them again. But when they pointed him to the right... He went in there and he thought, oh, this is all right. I've got my manuscript. This is the dream. This is what I want. I've protected what I've poured my life into. But then they took him into a room, and when they took him into that particular room, they had him all stripped down. They couldn't have anything on. And when he stripped down, one of the guards saw the manuscript, literally went over and picked it up and, and looked at it, and he just flung it. Pages went everywhere. Victor was demoralized. At that time, he says he didn't care if he could live. He would have soon gone into the other line. He would have soon walked into the gas chambers that day. Because what he had worked his whole life for is now just laying across that floor. He's standing there totally demoralized. He says he doesn't have any ounce of anything in him that wants to live, that wants to make it another day, that wants to make it another moment, that wants to do another step. But then they look at him, and there's a pile of clothes over there. These clothes aren't pristine. They're the clothes of people that have already died, and they had them take them off. So they're prison clothes that have been soiled. They're prison clothes that had been stained. They have him go over there and pick one. He picks up one. It smells. It's horrible. Someone had lived in it, and someone took it off right before they died. He's totally demoralized, wanting to end his life at that particular point, and he reaches in because each one of the units had a pocket right here on the front. And when he reached into that pocket, he felt something just sort of crumpled up. And he felt it, and he pulled it out. And when he pulled it out, he saw it was this little bitty piece of paper that had been crumpled together, and he uncrumpled it. And when he looked at it, it had two words on it. But he knew what the two words were, because if you were a Jewish boy, from your youngest age, you were taught to pray this prayer. It's one of three verses collected together. You prayed this prayer every morning and every night. 
There wasn't a day that a Jewish young man wouldn't have prayed that. But it wasn't the whole prayer. It was just two words. The words from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. It didn't even have the beginning where it says, O Lord of Israel. It just had the Lord. Just two words, the Lord. He talks about how he looked down and he saw those words, the Lord. And he says, as he began to look at him, something began to happen. He said, something came into his soul. The Lord. The Lord. The Lord. He says, I don't know how to describe it, but something began to ignite inside me, the Lord. And he said, I began to think, you know what? I'm going to get through this. You know what? I'm going to live through this. You know what? I'm going to make it through this because of the Lord. It doesn't matter what has just happened. I'm going to make it through because of the Lord. And he began to be inspired. When I read that particular story, it amazes me because two words got a man through the Nazi concentration camp, the Lord, because he knew on any day, no matter what was going on, God was still the Lord. He knew that no matter how bad things were, God was still the Lord. He knew that when he had doubts, God was still the Lord. He knew that when everything stood against him, God was still the Lord. And then I wonder about people like us, that we live in a time where we have 66 books of the Bible, and if he could survive on the Lord, we've got more than enough to make it through anything we're dealing with. But see, in your life, you've got to understand, God made you to be a person of hope. Yeah, you believe in God, but there has to be a hopeful aspect in you. There has to be something inside you. And you've got to understand that hope does for your soul what faith does for your heart. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19, it says that hope is the anchor of our soul. That when everything's moving and everything's chaotic and the winds are really bad and the waves are really high and everything seems to be overwhelming, there is a hope. There's a hope inside you that you are going to make it. You're going to get through your marriage problems. You're going to get through your kids' problems. You're going to get through your addiction problems. You're going to get through your financial problems. You're going to get through everything because there is the Lord. And so you were created to be a person of hope. And hope does for your heart and soul something that nothing else will do. But there's a third thing. Hope changes everything. People who have hope, it changes everything. Not only are people created for hope, not only does hope affect your soul, but it changes everything around you. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says this. It says, the thoughts that I have for you are for good and not for evil. See, when God thinks about you, he's not thinking, oh, man, you know, there's the worst Christian I've ever seen. There's somebody I'm not sure I want in heaven. There's somebody that I'm not sure can, can make it any further. It says the thoughts that God has for you are for good and not for evil. And it says to give you a hope. God wants to give you hope. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, he's called the God of all hope. In Romans chapter 4 and verses 18 and 19, it says that when there was no hope, God gave Abraham hope. And do you know what? God wants to give people hope because when they have hope, everything changes. And so God says, the thoughts that I have for you are for good and not for evil, to give you a hope and to give you a future. Because hope helps you see tomorrow better regardless of what today looks like. It helps you to see that tomorrow's gonna be all right because the Lord is still gonna be there. God's gonna be there with you. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, the events are, you're gonna do all right. But the thing that people forget is that where Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 was written, see, it wasn't written when Israel was in Israel. It was written to Israel when they were in captivity. The Babylonians had come in. They had literally destroyed Israel. They had taken everything from Israel. They had totally destroyed all the cities. Jerusalem did not exist. None of the stones were left in place. It was a total annihilation and destruction. These people are in captivity. And God says, I want you to know that I'm thinking about you. 
I want you to know that the thoughts that I have for you are for good. I'm thinking about how good your life's going to be. I'm thinking about how better you're going to be. I'm thinking about you. And then it says in there, and I want to give you hope. See, some of us think the only way we can have hope is for everything to be perfect around us. But it's not our perfect circumstances that give us hope. It is our perfect God that gives us hope. We don't draw our hope from the things that are external. We draw our hope from the one who is eternal. And in the midst of that, hope begins to change everything. He says, I know you're in captivity, but I want to give you hope. I know the problems look big, but I want to give you hope. I know everything looks against you, but I want to give you hope. I want to give you hope right where you're at right now. Even in the midst of captivity where everything looks like it's failing and disappointing you, I want to give you hope right now. I had a dear friend, he's since gone on to be with Jesus. Honestly, when I began in ministry and started the church that I pastor in North Dallas, he was my best friend. He was the guy that we would talk, and when Sundays didn't go well, we'd talk to each other, and we'd sort of complain and then repent, and we'd talk about, you know, how things had been, and when we had great successes, we would share them with each other. He's probably one of the finest pastors I've ever known. But he didn't come to faith in a church. In fact, his journey to faith was pretty unique. See, he was a second lieutenant during the Vietnam War. And during the Vietnam War, he was located on a fire base, and fire bases were basically mountains that had a grid number to them. No one could remember where they are today unless you had a grid map. But his job was every day to lead out a patrol. And when he would lead that patrol out, what would happen is they were to engage the enemy. They were to call back to the fire base. They were calling artillery. So it was a search and destroy mission. Every day, different patrols went out. But there was a strategy behind it. All the patrols went out in a sequence. And the sequence was there so that none of them were out there alone where any of them could be flanked. That you either had a fire base on one side of you or another patrol on another side with another fire base protecting them from a different angle that nobody could ever be attacked from the flank. But one day, my friend, he let his patrol out, but he misread the grid map. So he led his men down the wrong trail. He was in a position where his men could be flanked. And the enemy saw this, and they did that. A battle ensued, a battle that was deadly and costly. It's a battle that shouldn't have ever happened, but he had just misread the grid map. Other units ended up coming to their aid. They ended up fighting their way back, but it was at great cost. He talks about how he stood at the gate of the fire base and he watched as 20 young men and body bags were carried into the fire base. 20 of his men had died because he misread the grid map. Now, he's their commander, so his job is to go in and now write the letters. He's got to write it to the mamas, the dads. He's got to write it to the wives and the kids, talking about how valiant they're sons and husbands were and dads were and that they had died in the service of their country. But he knew that the circumstance was his fault. He had just met, misread the map. But as a result of that, he was overwhelmed. He couldn't handle seeing the body bags. He went back to his little bunk, a little hole in the ground literally, He sat there at the table, and when he sat there at the table, he wrote the first letter. He's just crying uncontrollably with grief. And he thinks to himself, I don't know that I can do this. He writes the second letter, and by the time he gets it done, he says, I knew I couldn't write another letter. How do I write and tell someone that their husband isn't coming home, their dad's not coming home because I made a bad decision? So what he did was the unspeakable. He went and got some whiskey, took his 45, and he went outside 
the perimeter, what they called the wire. Now, no one went out there because they knew if you went outside the wire without a patrol, you were dead. But he didn't care because his plan was very focused. He was going out there and he was going to kill himself. So he went to a small hill near the hill that the fire base was on, out there all by himself. In the middle of the day, he had this bottle of whiskey and he began to drink it. And his plan was, when I get to the end of this, I'm going to shoot myself. I can't go home with what I did. It was during that particular time that he began to drink it and he got pretty well towards the bottom. And at that point, he tells how he took the gun and he pointed it towards his mouth. And he's about to pull the trigger and he hears something. He's startled by it because he's where nobody should be. And so he stops and he looks around. The noise goes away. But when the noise goes away, he thinks to himself, well, what in the world was that? But the noise is gone. He drinks a little bit more, pulls the gun up, and he's about to pull the trigger. He hears the noise again. It's just a little louder this time. And again, he just is startled by it, and he begins to look around. He doesn't see anything or see anybody. And it's at that point that he drinks the last swig, and this is going to be it. He puts the gun up, and he hears the same thing again. But this time, he recognizes it. See, he recognizes that even though he wasn't raised in church, that as a little boy, he would occasionally go to grandma's house. And when he would go to grandma's house, grandma would sit him on her lap. She had this book that she would read that he later found out was the Bible. She'd read it, and then she'd sing a song. And the song was, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. He begins to hear that song. He begins to hear it inside him. And he says at that moment, he dropped his gun, dropped the bottle. He looked up to heaven, and he said, God... If you're real, I need to know you now. And that man who became one of the finest pastors I've ever known became a Christian in the middle of a war zone in a place he shouldn't have been in the worst moment of his life. And it was there that he found God. And what I want to say to you is this. Some of you feel like you're in the most hopeless situation. But if you'll let God be your hope, if you'll let the God of all hope be your hope, if you'll let the God of Abraham give you hope when there's no reason to hope, God will do something. And it doesn't matter where you're at, and it doesn't matter what's going on, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, that God will give you hope. So I want you to know three things right now. One, you were created to be a person of hope. Two, hope will do for your soul what faith does for your heart. And three, when you have hope, it changes everything on the playing field. But number four, the hope that God gives you is bigger than this life. It's bigger than this world. It's bigger than this environment. See, there's a verse that Christians love to quote. It's from Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. It says this, It says, nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. People get up and they they love it. Oh, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. But most of them can't quote the next sequence of things. Because he gives four comparisons. Those four comparisons are very, very specific. But the first comparison is this. We are more than conquerors. Nothing's going to be able to stop us, and it starts with these words, even death or life. What's intriguing about that is that that's not how we talked. 
If you were to write that, here's what you would write. I'm more than a conqueror in life and death. We wouldn't start with the word death and then go to life. But the reason God started with the word death before life is that God wanted us to know that there's life after death. But here's the thing. The hope that you have gives you hope that there's life after death. See, as I've mentioned, I'm, I'm with people on their worst day. I can't tell you how many times I've been with people when they took their last breath and they went to heaven. Can't tell you how many times. And when you've been there and you've held someone's hand, when they take their last breath and their eyes close and you sit there and you know that they're Christian and you know they're going to heaven, but you're dealing with the reality of death at the same time. Here's the thing that I can tell you, is on what I thought was their worst day, in a split second, they were looking at me and saying it was their best day. On the day that I thought I don't have any answers, they were saying in a split second, they had all the answers. On the day that I was most confused was the moment that they saw it the clearest because what our hope is, it's bigger than your marriage, it's bigger than your kids, it's bigger than your job. Our hope isn't a hope that's just based on earthly moments, it's based on heaven above. So what I want to say to you is this. Thank you for being profound people of faith. But can I ask you to be a profound person of hope? To be the person who's like Abraham when there is no hope. I'm going to have hope because I have a God above. And that the God of all hope will fill my life when I feel like there's no reason to keep hoping. Because in this world, if you can find people of faith who become people of hope, you found individuals that will change anything because Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to have hope in your life. Father, I pray for these people this night that you will do for them exactly what you've done for others, that you will be the God of all hope, the God of all hope, the God of all hope, that there's not any place, any time, anywhere in anyone's life where they're hopeless. They have hope in you. I pray, Father, that you will do for them what you did for Abraham that when there was absolutely no reason to have any hope, you gave him hope. When everything in his life said, no way, no how, you said, there is a way, there is a how. So I pray right now for people who have no hope for their marriages, fill them with hope. For people who've lost hope for their kids, give them hope. For people who've lost hope when it comes to their health, give them hope right now. For people who've lost hope for their career, give them hope right now. And for people, Lord, who've lost hope that you're even real, give them the hope of heaven right now. But whatever you do, Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, will you fill these people with hope? Would you lift your hands towards heaven? Father, right now, just fill these people with hope. Give their soul that baptism of hope that can only come from you. Give them, Lord, that power of hope that can only be in you, Lord. Give them hope for their souls. Give them hope that in whatever their circumstances Circumstances are, whatever their problems are, whatever their issues are, God, give them hope right now in Jesus' name. Let the hope of God be there. Let them be like David. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Thank you, Father, Lord, that we have a hope that according to Romans chapter 5 will never be ashamed. It will never be disappointed. And I thank you, Father, that according to Peter, we have a heavenly hope. And I thank you that that hope is in the soul of every person here. So today, Lord, I thank you that you speak hope to to the souls of your people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go any further, I want to tell you a story. My wife and I, who love Cindy so much, she thinks she's such a remarkable soul. 
my wife and I, we love to vacation and we love to vacation in California. So that's our frequent place that we would go to. One year we were vacationing and it's after a long time of ministry and we're just enjoying ourselves. And I wake up one morning in prayer and I feel like God says, I need you to get back to Dallas. Well, no one likes to cut their vacation short, but I feel it in my heart. I turned to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I said, we, we need to go back, is that all right? She's always such a wonderful woman of faith and she said, hey, I trust you, I trust God, if we need to go back. We fly back two days early as we land in Dallas, we get in our car, we're heading towards Plano. As we're on the road heading towards Plano, I pick up the phone and I call a man named David. David was a man in my church. And I said, David, I just have on my heart that I was to check on you. He said, Pastor, thank you, thank you. I knew you were on vacation and I didn't want to call you. But he said, Karen, my wife, she had stage four colon cancer. I think she's about to die. He said, we're at the hospital right now. I said, David, I'll get there as quick as I can. I got there and walked into the room and David's literally on the left side of the bed, if you were facing towards the feet, I went to the right side. I grabbed Karen's hand, I grabbed David's hand, and I prayed, Lord, let this be a peaceful moment. I watched as Karen took her last breath, she went to heaven. David and I just stood there for a minute because you know he's crying as he should, he just lost his wife. And so in that particular moment, We uncup our hands. We start to walk out. I'm sorry, every time I remember this, it's just not a story to me. It's the emotion of the room. So I just got to be honest with you. So it's even hard for me, and I tell it a lot. But we started walking out, and David in tears looks at me, and, and he says, Pastor, I just can't do this. I just, just can't do this. And I said, David, it's all right. See, I thought he was talking about the funeral. I said, David, I've done so many funerals, it's no problem, I'll take care of everything. You won't need to make one decision, I'll take care of everything. He said, Pastor, I'm not talking about that. See, when Karen died, they had five kids under the age of 16. They had a three-year-old, they had a five-year-old, they had a seven or eight-year-old right on in between. They had an 11-year-old and they had a 15-year-old. He said, Pastor, I can't do this. Karen was the glue. She was the one that kept the kids together, kept everything going. I, I just can't do this. And I look at David and I said, David, I said, I'm just going to ask you to do something. I said, I don't have an answer for you. There's no playbook for a single dad with five kids. But I said, I know that God wants to help you. So when you drive to work, he had a 40-minute drive. I said, I want you to pray in the Spirit. Now, prayer in the Spirit means this. We believe that not only can someone be saved, but they can be filled with the Spirit. And with that becomes a prayer language. And that prayer language is so that you can pray perfect prayers when you don't know how to pray them. And I said, David, when you're driving to work, I want you to pray in the Spirit for 40 minutes. When you come home, I want you to pray in the Spirit for 40 minutes. I said, will you do that? He said, yeah. Literally what happened was advance a year. I'm standing at the back door of the church. I'm shaking hands with people as they're leaving. David walks up to me and says, Pastor, you know what today is? I said, I do. It's the anniversary of when Karen went home to be with Jesus. And I said, David, I miss her just like you miss her. And he said, but do you remember what you told me? And I recited to him exactly what I just told you. And David looked at me and he said, Pastor, when I walked out of that room, I didn't have a clue. He said, I thought our family was going to fall apart. I thought there was no way I could keep our family together, that there would be any semblance of well-being in our family. But I did what you said every day. And after a year, God's held our family together, and it's been a perfect family for the last year.
And the reason I say that to you is that all of us at times will have ourselves in circumstances that are too big for us. And there's no prayer that your pastor is going to give you that is going to pray you out of that. But if you have the Holy Ghost in your life and in your heart, he will give you the words to pray so you can begin to ask God to do things that only God knows how to do. 